Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, no one really cares about who this who the speaker is. So yeah, read read this whenever you want. I do podcasting and blogging and shit like that. Um, <laughs> I am a firm believer in uh, the wisest man is he that knows that he knows nothing. Um, I am not an expert and I'm quite happy to admit that I know absolutely nothing. Um, I kind of like edge case stuff. It's kind of, um, it's freaky. Most people are like, ah, oh, it's just an edge case, no one really cares. Um, but the edge case stuff, the freaky stuff, the weird stuff kind of really interests me. It makes me think that's really cool, I should really dive into that. So. So this is part of the edge case stuff that people really don't give a shit about, but apparently all you guys do, otherwise you wouldn't have woken up early to come and see this. So I'm going to start with a quick warning. Um, this presentation, it contains numbers and jokes and uh, traces of peanuts. Um, who's ever seen me give a talk before? So if you had, you wouldn't be here, but yeah. Um, so yeah, everyone who's, uh, who's seen me give a talk before, I'm sorry, I use the same jokes every time. So just laugh when everyone else does. <laughs> Not you, Ed, you have to stay. Yeah. So I'm going to give everyone the, the TLDR and what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, the goal of this talk is to describe the defensive uses of HTTP status codes. That sounds really sexy, doesn't it? I like, yeah. This, this is an absolute must see at DEF CON on a Sunday morning. Um, <laughs> So back to why are you guys awake again? <laughs> I'm going to run through you know, the what, the why, the how, the goals, and then we're going to bring it together and we're going to review what we've, what we've covered. So I'm going to try and run through this reasonably fast so that I can get everything in. So let's start with the what. Okay, so HTTP status code. So who's never seen an HTTP status code? Yeah, okay, I thought so. So, so we know what an HTTP request looks like. We're picking out this specific section. This is the status code or the response code. You know, these the, the, the terms are interchangeable depending on how much you had to drink. Um, it, it's like a really small little thing. Every time you you make a request or every time um, you get an answer from a server, it comes with some kind of status code. Okay, no, no one really cares what they are. The browser doesn't really tell you what it is, but it's an important feature of the HTTP standard. Um, what I'm going to show you is it's like a really small detail, but it's it's a really big impact. You know, if, if you don't really pay attention to the status codes, then some bad things can seriously happen. So, a little bit of history on HTTP status codes. Um, there's an RFC. I'm sure everyone here has read that, right? Um, I couldn't sleep last night. I thought maybe I should read the RFC again, but yeah, that didn't happen. So, so there's five main classes of responses. You get the one 100, which is the informational stuff you don't get to see that very much. You get the 200 which is most of the time success. Your web page is here, here is the content, thank you very much, please go away. You get the 300 which is the redirect stuff, um, you get the 400 which means you fucked up, you get the 500 which means they fucked up. <laughs> Simple as that, okay. There's, there's also uh, a, a wonderful RFC and this one's actually worth reading for the 700 codes um, by uh, John Barton. Uh, if you go to his GitHub page, there's an, in, an entire section. Um, I like the meh. Uh, I am not a teapot. <laughs> I specifically like this one. Fucking unicorn. <laughs> no. So yeah, no, there's, there's like a th there's like 300 of these things. So uh, I know no idea how they squeezed it all into the 700 range because there's 300 of them, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, these are amazing, and I've no idea where, where did the 600 range go. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, I really hope they accept that RFC and start implementing that in some stuff. So, so let's go through the basic stuff. This is the theory bit. It's boring, and I'm sorry, but this is the theory. So you get the 100 informationals. So you get the 100 continue switch protocols processing. As I said, these are the things you don't get to see very much. Um, moving into the 200 stuff, it means it worked. You know, it means it understood. So you're getting a 200 OK, which is most of the web is returning a 200 OK. Um, you also get some weird stuff that you don't get to see very much, like 204 no content. It's like, great, thanks for the header. Um, <laughs> um, there's also uh, some interesting stuff that, that isn't supported by Apache. Um, but yeah, low on storage space. I've never seen that one returned by a server, but um, I'd, I'd really like it. But they're not supported by Apache, so, because I'm tight. 
Um, you get the 300 redirection stuff. So most people know what a 301 is, what a 302 is. Um, 300, you don't get to see very much. Multiple choices. What is it? It's like an exam. They give you like tick boxes or something. Um, 304 not modified as well is something you see quite a lot if you're, if you're looking at the, the way data flows backwards and forwards. You also get some weird stuff that isn't used anymore like switch proxy. That sounds like fun. Uh, use proxy is also interesting if you return a proxy setting in the location header. It says, oh, you should use this proxy for your communications. I'm sure no one would use that for malicious purposes in any way. <laughs> so moving on to the 400 which is the, the you fucked up section. Um, so forbidden, unauthorized, usual stuff, uh, 404 not found being quite a reasonable response for I search on random crap on the internet. And then you get some, some interesting stuff. I, I quite like the 407 proxy authentication required. Okay, um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. There's some wa e interesting ways to, to do some malicious stuff with that. This is a long list. Um, I quite like the 418. I'm a teapot. Uh, it's only in April Fools, and uh, quite a lot of web servers don't implement it. But this is interesting. You know, it's like I am indeed a teapot. Um, moving into the, the 500 stuff, internal server error, which is. Uh, Unfortunately used quite a lot for SQL injection. Oh, I got a 500 error, that must be a SQL injection trigger. Um, you don't get to see it very much if you're not abusing websites. It's still, you know, it's, it's interesting. So wow, that's a lot of fucking numbers. Um. <laughs> All right, so everyone here knows every single HTTP response code now, right? Great. No, I don't have to talk about them anymore. So, so why are we doing this? Okay, it started off as a little idea. I, I read a couple of books. Um, I do that on occasion. Um, I don't know if any of the authors are in the room. If so, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm plagiarizing your work. Um, and, and I started to have a little think, uh, what can we do with that? We can, we can do some interesting stuff with scanners. And uh, screwing with script kiddies is a hobby, should we say. It's, it's more of a life calling. Um, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that sounds like fun. That sounds like something I want to do at a weekend. Um, and I started to look, uh, look around and, and there's a guy that everyone follows on Twitter, right, the Garak, who's not here because he's drunk, or well, he should be. Um, he said um, in one of his quotes, stop dismissing obscurity as a security feature because unpredictability in your defense works to your advantage. Well, that's great. I mean, we can increase attacker costs being unpredictable. Um, and we can waste attacker time. Okay, we can say that you know, an attacker is going to waste three hours attacking a website that should take 15 minutes. Okay? Why should we just stand there and let someone smash us in the face? You know, we should be more active on our defense. So there's some prior art. I kind of I looked around. I was trying to find who else has talked about this stuff before because <laughs> in my mind this was just obvious stuff. I was like someone's bound to have already implemented this stuff. Um, there was a, a 2004 talk um, by Haroon Mir and the guys at SensePost where they mentioned using HTTP status codes to, to slow down attackers. It was a one line comment in a slide deck. That was it. I was like, okay, well, someone's mentioned it, so there must be more. Um, there was a, an interesting paper by uh, Gunter Olam, and I've probably totally mispronounced his name there. There's a, as a PDF where he talks about stopping automated attack tools. I was like, okay, well, this must cover it. And they cover, he covers lots and lots of stuff, but he, he doesn't really dig deep into using HTTP status codes to, to do this stuff. So, so I carried on and, uh, and I was informed, should we say, of a, of a mailing list comment where uh, Ryan Barnett um, said that, well, maybe we can reply with a 503 with a retry after header. Um, that was interesting. I, I tested it out. It didn't really seem to work because most scanners just completely ignore a retry after header. But maybe things have moved on. This was 2006 when that comment was made. So, so yeah. So no one seems to have discussed this stuff. So, so how are we going to do? How are we going to going to work this in? So, browsers have to be as flexible as possible. You get websites written by kiddies um, in Notepad, and you get professional websites written in HTML5 with web APIs and SOAP interfaces. And the browser has to be able to support it all. Okay. And and this leads to a certain amount of flexibility on, on how things are understood, how things are supported, um, which obviously leads to the dark side. Um, and then of course there's RFCs, which some would say is the dark side. Um, 
they're more of a guideline really. They're, they're kind of, this is the way you should do it, but we're not gonna tell you exactly how, so it depends how drunk you were when you read it. Um, maybe this makes sense. So, so yeah, what could possibly go wrong? You, know, you have 300 page RFC and people who are gonna interpret it and you implement it into a piece of software which has to be as flexible as possible, otherwise things don't work things are going to start to go wrong. So, so I started to do a little bit of testing. Okay, so I wanted to restrict myself to the big three. Okay, Internet Explorer, Chrome, or Chromium, and Firefox. Um, no, yes. Um, <laughs> apparently Opera turned like really bad or, or there's Lynx, but who uses Lynx? Yeah. Okay, there's like one guy who uses Lynx. Yeah. Welcome to the 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I wanted to take the easy option on testing, so I thought, okay, well, there's man in the middle proxy. I don't know if anyone's used it. So it's a Python based system for man in the middling HTTP connections. Um, it allows you to set up this really interesting reverse proxy. It's all script based and it does all the work for you. You just write something like this in a script file. That's it. You know, all this does is change every response code to a 200. <laughs> okay. That's easy. Even I can code that shit. Um, Unfortunately, man in the middle proxy tends to use up all of the memory you have on your machine. Um, even if you have eight gigabytes of memory in your laptop. Um, I would highly recommend man in the middle dump, which doesn't cache everything into memory. So, yeah, just a side note there. Um, I also used uh, PHP, you know, the amazing personal home page. Um, it, it allows you to, to set response codes, but there's some downsides. Um, you can also prepend a file which is going to allow you to set specific response codes or do some logic in the background. The problem is if the web server says, no, this is a, an, an incorrect request, the PHP is never going to get to actually see the request so you can't set response codes. So you can do some interesting stuff. For testing it's useful, but in production it's not really going to be as useful as it could be. So, so I, I used a, a, mismatch or a mismatch of Python and PHP for, for most of the testing. Um, you don't need to write this down because I'll, I'll release all the, the slides afterwards. But um, simple testing of browsers, how things are how things are supported. You just call a PHP page, which sets the the response code. You tell it what code in the URL, and you hope no one cross-site scripts your website. Um, as simple as that. You, you get a response. You get the, the requested response code and the actual response code. Um, because with PHP, you can set that response code to 999 if you want. But Python is just going to say, oh, sorry. Um, Apache is just going to turn around and say, uh, I don't know what that response code is. And then it just returns a 500, which is the they fucked up section of it. So, so yeah, you get to see what you requested, you get to see what the response was, um, and you get to see what the headers are. So just simple JavaScript running in the browser. So okay, so great. So I can, I can run off and, and start testing these browsers, um, which seemed like an easy thing. Um, I started to, to think, I've got all this data on, on how all these browsers, all these uh, browsers work, and how can I graphically display that in a nice fashion? Um, let's just say that I'm not good at charting. Um, uh, sorry for the for the women in the room. Also, um, I'm trying to keep this even across the sexes. So, um, so. I didn't really know how to display this. So I spoke to some guys who do visualization and they were like, oh yeah, we can do this and we can do that. And it was just all shit. Um, so what I ended up with was a table. <laughs> yeah, this is, this, is, this is the reason why I cut it down to three browsers because otherwise the table would be like this fucking wide. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a full table online which I'll release after the talk which has a lot of other browsers and scripting languages in it. Um, but this is the core three. So you start to see a, quite a lot of conformity in this, in this section about how the browsers respond to things. So I, I, I run it into three sections. So can you load HTML with a 100 response code? Well, you can but nothing appears. It doesn't render anything. So the browser just doesn't support it. Um, unless it's an iframe with Chrome in which case it tries to download it because I guess Chrome just likes to download shit. <laughs> um, what's what's kind of interesting, um, if you have Chrome on an Android phone um, and it res you respond with a 100 code, it tries to download it but it never finishes. So um, you have to restart your, your Android to get it to stop, which is, which is fun. <laughs> I'm sure no one would fuck with that, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
looking at this, you're like, okay, well, all the browsers are kind of mostly conform, you know, except IE, obviously, which doesn't care about a 205 and just renders the stuff. It doesn't really care. Um, you start to see some differences when you're looking at the 300 codes. Um, for example, uh, Firefox just doesn't load JavaScript if you respond with a 300 or a 301. Um, IE pretty much just ignores everything if you respond with anything in the 300 range which isn't a redirection. But Chrome pretty much accepts everything because it just doesn't give a shit. It's, it's the honey badger of browsers. <laughs> um, moving kind of into the 400 stuff, you start to see more conformity. Again, IE being the weird one. It just doesn't like loading iframes with weird response codes. Um, and you see these at uh, the time when it says 407 um, proxy, proxy, proxy. Um, basically, that, what that means is that uh, Chrome, depending if you have a proxy set or not, will load it. So if you have a proxy, an HTTP proxy set, then Chrome will load the content when it's responded with a 407. If you don't, then it won't. Okay. Again, with the 500s, things are pretty standard. Again, IE being kind of a little bit of a weird outlier on things. Okay. So. Think about this for a second. You got browsers that kind of handle things in slightly different ways. What can we do with that kind of stuff? But you know, a majority of stuff is like, okay, that's just content. I don't care what it is. It's loading stuff. It's like you get a, a 400 response and it's like, oh, I see HTML. I'm just going to render that for you. Or I see JavaScript. I'm just going to run that JavaScript for you. So yeah, most thing, mostly, things are loaded quite normally. But there's some, some weird kind of outliers. So with HTML responses, almost all response codes are rendered correctly. It doesn't care. When you try and load an iframe and it comes back with a response, there's some special cases for IE because IE is special. Um, but most of the time kind of things are even. And if you start looking at JavaScript, there's very limited support for it. Okay, Chrome being the exception because they just don't care. Okay, so we know what browsers interpret differently. Um, so what do all the browsers have in common? Okay. Well, what are they doing the same across, across the board? Um, the 100 codes, retries, confusion, as I said, fun on Android, never ending downloads, um, and it times out eventually. Okay. Because the browser thinks there's more coming. The browser thinks, oh, you're going to send more data in a minute. I'll just kind of sit here and wait for you, um, which is kind of interesting. The, the 200 codes, again, you get the no content or not modified. You just get headers saying no. There's, there's nothing here. So as you would expect, all the browsers just ignore any kind of content that you're responding because it doesn't expect there to actually be any content within those things. Um, so what about headers? Okay, so RFCs quite a lot of the time in kind of a muddy language say, if you're responding with a 3XX response code, whether it's 301 or 302 or 303, there should be a location header, okay? It doesn't mean it has to. If you respond and you don't have a location header, it just kind of ignores the fact that it's meant to do a redirect and then renders whatever content you give it. Um, specifically, no location header, no redirect. This makes sense, okay? Because you're responding with a 302, it's looking for the location header, it doesn't find one. Instead of just giving you an unhelpful error in your browser, it's just going to render what you returned and ignore. Simple as that, okay? So the 401 unauthorized as well, if you're not sending back a www, www authenticate header, it's not going to prompt you. Simple as that. So, and I mentioned previously about the 407 proxy authentication required, the way Chrome deals with it. Again, if you're not requesting the authentication, then it's never going to prompt you. Okay. On the flip side, just because an RFC says a specific status code shouldn't have a header, doesn't mean it can't have a header. Um, so if you read, um, the, the RFCs, there's, there's 300 multiple choices. Now this shouldn't have a location header. It doesn't redirect you. It should come up with an HTML where you can specifically select where you would like to go. Unless of course you're Firefox or IE. In which case if you give it a location header it's just going to redirect. But Chrome isn't. Okay? And there are so many headers out there you can play with. I've played with quite a lot of them. Most of them are not particularly interesting unfortunately. But there's more work to be done in that kind of area. There's a, there's a load of headers like the retry after header that, that can really be played with and a little bit more research is required there. So each browser is handling something a little bit differently. Um, we know how things are handled the same. We know how things are handled differently. I wonder what we can do with that. You know? So 
what can we do with that? What are, what are the goals? Okay, so each browser handles things differently. You have the handled codes, you have the unhandled codes, and then you get this little browser weirdness thing where it just does random stuff you just didn't expect it to do, depending on the on the headers. Um, so browser fingerprinting. Okay, so yeah, you can check user agent strings, but that's client side controlled. You can easily spoof that stuff. Um, but if you take the differences, you can really do some interesting fingerprinting work on, on Firefox, on Chrome, and on IE. So on Firefox, based on the information we have, it doesn't load JavaScript returned with a 300. Okay? The other browsers do. So you simply return a JavaScript with a 300, and if the JavaScript runs, it's Firefox. Simple as that. Okay? Um, with Chrome as well, it, it loads Java return with a 307 temporary redirect without a location header, but the other browsers don't. So again, we can do the same kind of thing and we can do some fingerprinting. And with IE, it loads JavaScript return with a reset content status code and nothing else does. So if we can add all that stuff together, you can get a nice way of fingerprinting the main browsers without even bothering to look at the location header. Or you can use, sorry, uh, the user agent header. Or you can use the user agent header and then specifically say, um, well, I'm going to check that by seeing how your browser really works. Okay, so, so I'm going to do a quick demo. Well, actually, I lied. I'm going to run a quick video of a demo because I didn't want to connect to the network here. <laughs> First talk. Yeah, so all this is doing is loading a PHP page um, and then running through and loading three individual um, pages. Cool. Um, it then checks the responses, checks the JavaScript, and says, okay, so this JavaScript ran, this JavaScript didn't, so you must be using this specific browser. Okay, so if you zoom in, well, if I zoom in, there you go. So you can see the specific responses. You can see that uh, it's loading an HTML. It's coming back with a um, with a 300, a 307, and a 205, which are the three specific response codes we talked about for the different browsers. It's then sending all of that stuff to a PHP page on the server, and the PHP page is returning and saying, "Okay, this is the specific browser." Okay, so obviously. I'm returning back to the browser to, to display a pop-up to say this is the browser. In most cases, you're, you're responding, you're sending it to the server, and then you're never responding back because I know I'm running IE. I have the little IE bar at the top. I don't need you to do a pop-up and tell me. But, um, but the server now knows exactly what kind of browser you're using. So if you're spoofing a user agent string, then I can say, okay, so user agent string says you're running Firefox, but you're actually running Chrome. That's suspicious. And that's something that we should be looking at. Okay. So there's various other options for fingerprinting. These specific um, option I, I selected was kind of the easiest option. There's various other stuff. There's a 300 redirect. There's a 400 iframe on an Internet Explorer. Um, if you want to look at the proof of, con uh, proof of concept, if you go to c22.cc proof of concept fingerprint.html, it'll run the same example that I just ran. And you can look at the traffic um, and the code is available. I'll, I'll link to that at the end. So user agents can be spoofed. Okay, everyone knows that. Even script kiddies unfortunately know that. Um, but, but browser traits are really hard. Okay, because your browser responds and does things in specific ways. Okay, so, so we've done that. We can fingerprint browsers. So what else can we do? Proxy detection. We specifically talked about the way Chrome handles things. And if you have an HTTP proxy set, you can specifically say, okay, I know they're using Chrome. I'm going to respond with a 407. If it loads the page, then they're using an HTTP proxy. Okay, there's unfortunately limitations here. It doesn't pick up with SOX proxies, but your average user isn't using a SOX proxy anyway. So it, it's of limited interest, but it, it's something that needs further, further, uh, further testing. So again, as I said, all you do is respond with a 407 with a proxy authentication header and, or without a proxy authentication header, and if Chrome responds, then HTTP proxy is set. So while I was doing this uh, research, I decided I was going to try a couple of different HTTP proxies. And uh, one of the proxies I selected was Privoxy. Um, it's a quite a popular um, privatizing HTTP proxy. Um, so I found while I was testing this, if you respond with a, so your web server, you go to my web server, you respond with a 407 proxy authentication required, you get the pop up in, in your browser. But it doesn't say that my web server asked you for a username and password. It says Provoxy asked you for a username and password. Which is interesting. So why is my local proxy asking for a username and password, I thought. So I typed in test test and I clicked send and um, 
my web server gets my username and password. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. I'm sure we can use that for some malicious stuff. Um, but this is a defensive talk, so I'm not going to dive too much into that. But it's kind of interesting. Let's just say proxies aren't always configured quite so securely as, as they could be. Um, there's a fix for that now, so you can download the latest version. But you know, it's not just Provoxy. Any transparent proxy, things like Burp or Zap, they're specifically designed to just pass everything you give it. So if my web server responds with a 407 and asks for authentication, Burp Suite will just pass it to your browser. Simple as that. So, so you can start screwing with people who you know are doing malicious things on your site with um, intercepting proxies. You know, of course, if you're doing a test with Burp Suite and it pops up and says what's your username and password, I'm probably not going to type in my real username and password. But you never know. Script kiddies type in weird stuff. So, so let's bring all this stuff together. Okay, so we've got status codes that, that are treated like content. They don't care. You've got status codes that really are not specifically well handled, specifically the 100 codes. And you've got lots of little browser quirks that we can abuse. So, so what can we do? We can play with things, just in case there's children in the room. Um, we can make the people who like RFCs cry into their beer. Okay, so, so let's try to, to use what we've discovered. Let's break some spidering tools, cause some false positives, false negatives, um, slow down attackers, which is probably one of the most important things that we can do, give us time to respond to how people are attacking us, um, and then block successful exploitation. Okay, so even if they do manage to exploit the server, if you're responding specifically with different codes, maybe their exploit's not going to work. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about spiders. Um, this is a very simplistic and na naive view of spiders, but you access the target URL, you read the links, you test them. If true, continue. Okay, so if you get a 200 OK, that's true, right? And if you get a 404, that's false, right? But what happens if everything is a 200? And what happens if everything is a 404? You get start to get some weird stuff. And what happens if everything is a 500? You know, sometimes if everything's a 500, then everything's a SQL injection attack. So if everything's a 200, you end up with this interesting loop of, oh, I've found another directory. I will just keep scanning and keep scanning and keep scanning. You get this never-ending spider. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of a spider eating itself. So. Um, if anyone has one, please send it to me. Um, and if everything's a 404, what website? <laughs> I don't know if you can see this at the back. This is uh, the wonderful Acunetics tool, um, the Script Kiddies tool of choice. Um, the crawler found zero pages, zero files, and validated zero findings. Yeah. So what website? There is no website there. Um, Skipfish loves it. Um, it just keeps going and going and going until it kills itself because. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing at this point my test server just decided it didn't have enough memory to deal with all the responses. Um, you, if you look closely, there's also 2,000 low, 2,000 medium uh, false, false findings on the scan alone. So, uh, yeah. Playing with, uh, with people's spiders is kind of interesting. But, okay, so false positives, false negatives. Okay, so we can, we can start to hide how bad or how good our servers are, start to really screw with people and waste their time. So most scanners use response codes in some way. Okay, they kind of have to. You, you speed up detection. Um, you can't use regex for everything. It's the easy solution. Okay, so if if we start to respond with again 200 OK, 404, 500, and if we start to play with them and respond with random codes, um, random being a selection of codes that are handled well by all normal browsers, so the normal people browsing the website are not going to be affected in any way. You start to see some really interesting stuff. So, so we, it's a quick baseline using W3AF. Um, I didn't particularly pick on these people, it just happens to be an interesting baseline. So, so a standard baseline for my test system was 79 informational points, 65 vulnerabilities, no shells, which kind of makes me a sad panda, but no shells. And it took an hour and 37 minutes to do a scan. Okay, so, so if everything responds with a 200 OK, you still get everything. Okay, so we're not, we're not winning on the, the false positives and false negatives. It takes you nine hours to run the scan, which is kind of interesting, it, it lets us win time, but it's not really working. So a 200 OK isn't really going to do what we need it to do. So if everything's a 404, um, it's a lot quicker to do the scan because you're not finding everything, but it's, it's missing a majority of the information points and a majority of the vulnerabilities. OK, 
Okay, so you're starting to see some interesting stuff. If if we start responding with weird codes, they don't find everything. Okay, that's interesting. Um, if you respond with everything with a 500, wow. False positives. If it's a 500, like I said, it's SQL injection. Okay, 9,000 <laughs> informational points. <laughs> Try digging through that report. You know, 9,000 confirmed vulnerabilities. I could just see that pen test report. Sorry that vulnerability analysis. That's going to be about a thousand pages long. It's like, oh no, we found all this stuff. We have IAS vulnerabilities and this and that. It's, it's an Apache server but we still have all of these IAS vulnerabilities. <laughs> so, is there any people who use Nessus in the room? No. Okay. So if we start using random status codes, okay, I, I did m multiple runs of this to make sure that, that I'm getting accurate because if it's being random, maybe I just had a bad run. So th it averaged out as giving you a reasonable amount of false positives. Um, and it took less time to, to run the scan. Um, what I found interesting on this was that a majority of the things that it did find, it didn't find the real vulnerabilities, it just found weird stuff. So even though it found more vulnerabilities and you get lots of false positives, they're pretty much all false positives. So the real stuff just doesn't get found at all. Okay. So and skip fish and random, wow. Um, it doesn't like random. Let's just say Skipfish is particularly picky about it. So the first scan time took 10 hours and the second scan time took 4 seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, and then again 16 hours. I, I ran it about 5 times and it would just randomly flick between times. So, so Skipfish is, is a wonderful denial of service tool for web applications. Um, I think in my, uh, in my proxy it sent like 33,000 requests inside 5, 6 minutes. It was just, yeah, it'll pretty much take down everything. So. So we're not really slowing attackers down. Okay, so, so what can we do to slow the attackers down? Um, well, what's our WAF really doing at the moment? Okay, a standard WAF, again, a naive view, oh my god, I'm being attacked, block or return an error, whether or not that's a 403, a 500, or a 404, or a 200 with a nice message telling them to piss off. Um, profit? There's no profit there. Okay, for us as defenders, with my defender hat on, we've won nothing. All we've done is blocked an IP address or blocked an attack. Um, they come back with an obfuscation, we bypass it, game over. Okay. So why are we doing that? Okay. Remember this big list of status codes that browsers don't handle very well? Specifically um, the 100 stuff? Well scanners don't like them either. Surprising there. You know, because a scanner thinks it's going to be a browser. It's trying to do everything that a browser does. So looking at the 100 codes, we can start to, to really screw with stuff. So, so does anyone remember the La Brea Tar Pit? Yeah, I know you remember. Yeah. So that should be Tom Liston, not Tim Liston. <laughs> Apologies, Tim. Um, so it's <laughs> it was originally designed to slow the spread of, uh, of code red and it slows down attackers. I mean, this was a great idea. Did we forget this, that this was a great idea? Did we think that, okay, well, it's been done now, we can just forget about it? In our, in our drive to kind of find new and interesting research, it's been done once, so we should just ignore it for the rest of time? So I had this interesting idea. Um, how about an HTTP tar pit? Okay? People have probably talked about this a thousand times before, but, you know, it was interesting to me. Well, This, this is the problem when you run PowerPoint. <laughs> drink, drink. Oh. Morning, DEF CON. It's Sunday morning, you know what that means? Drink. Drink. That's right. So, a round of applause for our first time speaker. How's he doing so far? Doing okay? <laughs> all right, hook us up. I am not drinking all of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, uh, who's, who's first time at DEF CON? First hand up, right here, come on up on stage. <laughs> if it's Sunday morning, that means this is the hardcore, right? Right here, you guys all got up, good job. All right. Congratulations. Cheers. <clears throat> oh, that reminds me of last night. <clears throat> <laughs> 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 
So where was I? Um, oh yeah, I was in the top hit. So simple scenario. Um, so the WAF detects the scan. Again, we're at the oh my god attack section. Um, it adds this IP address to the naughty list. And, and then it starts to rewrite all the responses. Okay, so you get the, the, the usual 100, 101, 102 status codes. We just randomly rotate between them, depending on how bored we are at the time. Um, we can also use 204, 304, which could be useful, but it's not nearly as fun as the 100 status codes. So, so let's do some experimentation, shall we? There's no actual science included in this, um, but yeah. So Nikto, uh, wonderful tool. Um, I like it a lot. I especially like the logo. Um, so the baseline scan, two minutes, 18 seconds to find 18 findings. Okay, simple as that. So um, with the top hit, um, yeah, we're, we're winning some time there. Let's just say that. <laughs> um, it's like a 340 fold um, increase in time, but it's still finding quite a lot of stuff. Okay, this is mostly informational stuff like you have an Apache whatever version as your server header and even if you respond with 100 code, it's still going to get that header. Okay, so most of that stuff is kind of uninteresting. Some of the, the findings, are, they disappear and the script kitty spends 14 hours scanning your web server. Okay, so you know, we're kind of winning. So W3AF, um, again, same baseline as before, one hour, 37 minutes, 65 findings. But wait a minute, this is going in the wrong direction. It's 18 minutes instead of one hour 37. It's weird. That shouldn't be happening. But it didn't find anything. So um, I'm guessing there was uh, some kind of algorithm there that said, I'm just going to stop bothering to scan your web server now because it's kind of weird and I don't know what the fuck's going on. <laughs> so, so, yeah, um, so yeah, back to the, the denial of service skip fish tool. Um, 18 minutes, 10 seconds to, to find around two and a half thousand low mediums and a couple of highs, um, which unfortunately even on the baseline were mostly false positives, but yeah, <laughs> whatever, each to their own. So five seconds. Again, we're going in the wrong direction, okay, but, but there was no lows and there was no mediums and there was only three highs. Um, what I thought was interesting was the three highs that it found were not any of the 12 highs that it found previously. <laughs> so, um, so not only false positives but r different false positives to the normal scan. So okay, well it's kind of doing weird stuff and we like weird stuff because you know, we're mucking around with, with automated scanners and we're screwing with script kiddies so random is good. So Acunetics, as I said before, the script kiddie tool of choice. Um, so you get a one hour scan, it's quite reasonable, um, with a huge amount of informational stuff that you probably don't care about. And again, we're going in the wrong direction and this HTTP target should be sh slowing stuff down but it's making stuff faster depending on what scanner you're using. Um, but again, okay, that's an interesting ratio um, of complete false negatives. So it's, it's just not finding stuff. So some of these scanners are just like, okay, now this, this web server is just playing silly buggers. I'm just going to stop bothering to scan it at all. But what's interesting, it doesn't tell you that it's just going to give up. It just says, I'm finished. It just says, no, I'm done. So, so what do we find? So you can slow down some scanners, things like Nikto. Others give up quicker because they just get tired of getting responses from the server or they time out and say the server's not there anymore. If you look through a log file, I'm sure somewhere along the line it says the web server stopped responding even though it didn't. Um, but you get a lot of unreliable and aborted scans. Okay, so up to 100% less findings. Okay, that's, that's a win for us. Yeah. So let's move on to so blocking successful exploitation. So even if someone can get past all of this, they can find a high crit criticality in your web server. Um, so We've made it hard for them to find them, but people are going to find these vulnerabilities no matter what. Okay, we've, we've made it so that possibly it's going to take them 15,000 times longer to find the vulnerabilities, but they're going to find stuff. So, so let's stop them from popping shells with Metasploit. Um, now, how often does Metasploit reference status codes? Okay, so anyone care to guess? No, it's about a thousand. Okay, give or take, you know, this is not scientifically sound and it depends very much on how people are wording things and how they're using their variables, but this is a, a simple grep through searching for res.code, resp.code and response.code. Okay, so these are the usual things that, that, uh, that people use and, you know, there's lots of dependency on status codes. Um, unfortunately, even the stuff that I wrote uses status codes. So, yeah, I know it's, it's bad programming but it's 
it's quick and it's what we all do because we use status codes to, to check the response from servers. So here's an example of a, a simple um, snippet of code from one of the, the Metasploit uh, checks. So all it's doing is it's checking if the response code is less than a 200 or more than a 300. Okay. So I can return a 500. That's great. I mean I can return a 500 with the content. Um, and then it's failing. Okay. So if it's, if it's not anywhere in the 200 range which is the okay then the exploit just fails. Simple as that. Okay. Great. So, so if we're spoofing 404 but still giving you the content then this exploit is always just going to fail. And if you're good enough to go in and edit the code and change things and you really know what's going on, then you're not really the target of this talk. Okay? We're targeting script kiddies who know absolutely nothing. All they know how to do is run the code and if it doesn't work they just cry in a corner. Um, interesting side effect, um, if it is a 401 it just starts to print out the response headers like the www authenticate or the authentication header. Of course as we mentioned before we don't need to send those headers. So um, what happens if you don't send those headers? You start to get errors within Metasploit because it's trying to print out stuff that it shouldn't really, you know, should, should be there but it's actually an, a nil value because we haven't actually set it at all because we haven't provided it. So that's an interesting side effect. So no match, no shell. Okay? No cookie for you. Simple as that. So quickly running through what we've talked about here. Okay? So we can use status goes to our benefit. It's fun. It's useful. And we can slow people down with it. Um, but browsers can be quirky. So we need to do it in specific ways. Um, and scanners and attack toolkits are, you know, they're set in their ways. You know, this is the way we did it in 1990 and god damn it this is the way we're going to do it in 2013. You know, get off my lawn. <laughs> you know, it's just the way things are. You know, why change things if it's working? So you know, my goal here is to make it not work. Um, WAFs need to seriously get more offensive about their defense because they're being far too passive as far as I'm concerned. Okay? So you know, just blocking a request, providing a snazzy little ASCII art that tells people to go and scan someone else's web server, it's great and it's fun but it's not really going to help us. Um, and I'm not talking hacking back. I don't, I don't want to start hacking people and, well actually I do. Um, I don't want to start hacking back people who attack my web servers but I want to be more active in fighting back and saying to people that this is, this is not right. If you're scanning my server I'm going to screw with you and I'm going to screw with you until you cry. It's just, just the way things down. So, so slowing attackers down is good. Um, making life harder for skiddies is absolutely priceless. Um, I should have put the MasterCard logo on that. So current tools are very much the same as APT. Yeah, I said that. Um, they are adequate <laughs> and they do what they do and until someone fights back and says this is not good enough anymore then they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. Simple as that. So they're only advanced as they need to be. Okay, it's just like people attacking you. If they can get you with a phishing attack, then why would I bother wasting a zero day on you? Simple as that. Um, and I think this is, the, this is the key to this entire talk. Screwing with script kiddies is fun. Um, I've, got, I've had this running on my web server for a while now and uh, just checking the logs, it's absolutely hilarious the amount of automated scans that hit your web server searching for like uh, Tom, Tim Thumb and uh, how long it takes them to finish just a simple scan of your web server. Just checking your logs, they spend days just scanning your web server for random stuff. So how can people implement this? Okay, there's no point in me talking about this stuff if we don't know how we can implement this stuff. So, so let's talk about the ghetto option. You know, we can implement it using PHP. Okay, it's the lowest common denominator. Um, people probably wrote it in Notepad but that's life. So you can auto prepend a PHP file to say randomize the response code within a specific uh, section of, uh, of response codes that are supported by the browsers. But again, we're limited by resources that are PHP handled. So if your web server starts to error out because people are sending stuff that isn't to be expected, then the web server is going to respond back. So there's limited functionality there. There's man in the middle dump. Um, again, man in the middle proxy, as I said at the beginning, it's a real memory hog. It will just use everything you've got. So if you put man in the middle dump as a reverse proxy in front of your web server, you can have some simple scripts that are just going to change the response codes. Okay, that works. It works. But it's not the best solution. Okay, so, so what's this enterprise approved solution? So everyone knows Nginx, right? It's like Apache but better. Um, it's a usable implementation. 
Nginx is used quite often as a reverse proxy. Um, and if you use something like Nginx Lua, you can write some interesting scripts that are going to change the response codes that are going out of Nginx. Okay? So you simply uh, load Nginx Lua and using Nginx status you can specifically set stuff. Okay? So the only problem is there's kind of a few bugs in the non-git version. Um, specific codes that are supported just tend to get returned as nil which is kind of a pain but if you use the version, um, if you use the version from git it shouldn't be so much of a problem. Okay, so but, but if you do an apt get install and then install nginx and install the optional extras, you're going to run across a couple of problems. Okay, so what does the future hold? Okay, what's the next step? Well, the next step, I've been trying to get this into mod security to ease adoption um, by implementing it into something that people are using already on a daily basis. Okay, because no one wants to implement another layer of stuff. Because the more you install, you're increasing your attack surface. So you want to put something, change a couple of configuration files in mod security and just have it do this stuff without you having to think about it. Okay? But it's not simple. It's not easy. Um, I've been discussing it with various people for about a year and everyone's like, yeah, that should be possible. Maybe. Kinda. But I don't know how. So this is kind of a long shot but I need some help with this stuff. Okay? I'm not a C coder. And I'm not into writing Apache modules. But if anyone is interested in this kind of stuff and they really want to implement it into mod security, then I would really appreciate the help. Okay. So how do we counter this research? Okay. So we've, we've told the scanners that they're crap. We've told the scanners that they, they aren't doing stuff in the right way. Really need a new microphone here. Um, so less reliance on status codes. Like I know it's easy to say um, but we're going to have to slow scanners down in order for them to be more reliable. Okay? Because right now they're just taking response codes and just ignoring everything else. So start paying more attention to the actual content of the, the site itself. And some scanners are doing this already but things need to be double checked. Okay? So you get better matching if you do that. Problem is regex matching is kind of slow. It's going to use more memory, it's going to take more time, it's not easy. But this is the cat and mouse game. You know, every, every time we come up with something new or increase our security, then people who are attacking websites or testing websites increase the productivity and increase the, the accuracy of their tools. So hopefully we can move this to the next level. So um, that's all I've got. Any questions? So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is uh, have I specifically looked at detecting uh, specific scanners and how they look when they're attacking a web server? Um, yes, I have looked at it, not as part of this research, as part of other research. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. You can also detect quite easily when Nikto is attacking your website. Um, the, the problem is, is, is it's the same as this stuff. As soon as you start detecting how specific scanners look when they hit your website, the scanners are just going to start randomizing how they request stuff. So it's, it's another step in the, the, the kind of cat and mouse game. So, yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, F5 you can write scripts to specifically do this stuff. So yeah. it's, it's interesting. So I'm sure everyone here has an F5. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, the question was do different versions of browsers respond in different ways? Um, at the beginning of my testing, I was checking all the different versions of IE. And IE6 tends to do things in a kind of weird way. Um, you get some weird stuff um, like with the, the 100 codes it tries to download stuff but you know, it, it's sp between specific versions they don't tend to change the logic at all. So, so I'm getting the wave so if anyone has any further questions or any further comments um, the code is available whoa, the code is available on my GitHub site and I'd just like to leave you with the thought that uh, whatever doesn't kill you makes you smaller. Thank you.